And the aim in everything we do is to transform readers into writers. So we give them inspirational, enjoyable e encounters with reading and writing, and we use that as the kind of foundation to um, inspire them to create stories of their own. Um, so while we work a lot with children's literature, children's authors, many children's publishers, we operate beyond traditional publishing as well um, uh, by uh, taking a kind of very diverse artistic approach to what literature means. And, and within the word diversity, we use the term lingui linguistic diversity as well as multicultural diversity. Um, so diversity in every, for every shape and form is what our pop-up movement is about. Uh, and the project I'm just going to introduce you to uh, called Fusion was a project we did in 2013. Um, and it was kind of built on those values of uh, diversity, inclusion, and, and uh, experimentation and, and co-creation. And um, it was a project with four family groups, uh, Somali speakers, Turkish speakers, uh, Spanish, Colombian speakers, and uh, Bangla, Bangladeshi speakers. And they were in four family groups, in, uh, two in Islington, two in Camden. Um, they, they uh, probably about 15, 20 in each group. Um, each one had a writer-translator working with them for, for eight sessions, was it, mm. the whole, whole time? Uh, a filmmaker working with them, and either two illustrators from House of Illustration or two puppeteers from Little Angel Puppet Theatre. And in, in, this, in this big collaborative um, melting pot, uh, the whole idea was to produce these animations at the end of it. But the, the animations weren't just about the kids and the parents telling stories together. They were also about bringing artists together, none of whom had ever, ever made animations, in fact. So the whole thing was a kind of giant experiment, really, and quite expensive also. Um, so it was as much about harnessing bilingual skills of children and parents as it was about collaborate, artists collaborating across disciplines. Um, and one of, the, th one of the, the, the kind of headline feedbacks from a head teacher actually involved in the project was that there was no dominant partner in the group. And that was one of the formulas for its success. Neither the parent, the child, nor any of the artists. None of the kids were being taught to. It was all about devising stories. It was all about then how do we reinterpret those stories. And it was all about how do we produce those into a film at the very end of it. So everybody had, there was a real sense of equality around it. But I think ultimately what we were, what we were trying to do, and, and I'm, we're not specialists in any way in this subject at all, was really highlight the power and potential of bilingualism. That, that actually, it's, it's interesting in some of the documentation for today, I saw the word, uh, what are the challenges we face in working with bilingual young people. I think we need to change the word and use the word opportunities because these are often very intelligent people, parents and children, whose voices don't often get heard. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Thierry. Terry uh, Fasil was the writer translator in the, S the Somali project, and we're going to see the film afterwards. But you're going to talk a little bit about the process. Just the process, yes. <coughs> so uh, yes, just about describing an absolutely wonderful experience which I took part in. I mean, uh, I work in theatre. I'm a director, workshop leader. Also, I'm very, very lucky to have been part of this the kind of project, I very strongly believe in languages. Um, I was born in France, I'm a West African, um, I can work, I can go and feel comfortable in many different places in the world because of languages. And I've always tried to talk to young people about, please try, try to, to, to embrace it and use it rather than quite often hide the fact that you'd speak another language and then maybe there's a couple of floors left, right and center. So yes, fantastic project. I ended up in a room with uh, families with this, I work with a Somali group. And at first it was a very, very quiet group of people. I think because of the nucleus from home taking this, they, they were there and the children did speak a different language. The, some more, a, lot of, a lot of the mothers didn't speak English. So I think what started really well by saying, actually, we're going to work with your language and with your culture. So the tongue started to untangle a little bit, which was very interesting. Then I started, decided to use a lot of physical activities rather than sit. And as Dylan said, it was not about us teaching, it's about sharing together. Um, so I used something I developed with using different exercises, which is live storyboarding. I used the mothers and the children together standing up doing, talk, using their languages, and 
describing the action, and then the children were drawing the pictures, so we storyboarded like that. And we ended up making an entire film, um, working with the uh, designers, etc., and the children all together. It was a wonderful experience. Uh, at the end, people were very, very comfortable, and I really, really loved what it did to this community. I started a workshop very, very shy, and coming out, this is us, we're being we're being uh, put, put forward. Um, that's, yes, that's about, well, I forgot, sorry, I, f I ran this morning, I forgot my notes. So, <laughs> I think this more, but definitely I'll be able to answer a lot of questions afterwards. But now we could watch the film and see what, what happens to, in that project. Maya was so delicate. Wahun Baguta Ikara. Hagabaka Daran, a Maso Garikara. Maharapta Bankubarea, Wahia, and Jogo, Enugu, Urabamel, Unosto. What chogi Kasta like you are in a joked cocosale. Waxay ii soo uriya hilib ay ran ah aniga aya karinaya toro digaag maya waxa ii soo uriya hilib dadaar oo cayliin ah maya runta qofna ma joogo It's really lovely if you see all four of the films as well because they're all very, very different. But the, the unifying thing in, in I kind of find with most children when they create stories together is they get very dark and very moral. And that's an example really of giving them the freedom to tell their stories because teachers often steer them away from those kind of subjects. Um, and uh, I, Thierry was talking about the, the participants in that. We did a premiere of all four of the, the films here actually and it was a packed audience, about 100 people. And we had this, the Somali families were the ones who get up and presented the event. And, um, they were, just, they were just so uh, vocal and articulate, and it kind of defied that um, notion that we, we often write about these communities in grant applications as being disenfranchised and marginalized, and these people were anything but. Um, I just want to quickly share some learnings from it. Well, we went on to do quite a big research project, which has never been shared with anybody on the basis of this. Uh, just some stats from that project, 87% of parents and 52% of children spoke their home language the most at home. So you have this quite big disparity between children and parents, but all, all of them are speaking their home language in the home. 52% of parents had never read a book in their home language. Those were almost exclusively, exclusively Somali and Bangladeshi, um, some Turkish as well. 
75% uh, of teachers said that they'd impact, the project in, impacted positively on pupil behaviours and ac academic performance. And all the schools wanted to continue to do more work with these families, but of course there wasn't funding available to do that, and who knows whether they actually went forward and did anything. Um, it's going to be my point right at the very end of this. We then wanted to um, look into that issue of... Uh, parents who, whose English is second language not having books to read, which would seem to be quite a big question. Um, so fortunately, we're our education work is sponsored by Linklater, the global law firm, um, and they gave us their uh, a bank of translation credits they have. And Linklater's, because they're such a big firm, they can translate anything into any language in the world, including regional dialects. So we got them to translate a questionnaire for parents into 11 languages, some of them European, um, but they included Turkish, Bangla, Somali, Yoruba, and Twi. And um, we went and surveyed 106 parents in um, schools across three London, London boroughs. This is about a 45-minute exercise, so it's quite deep-level um, research, and they were obviously answering the questions in their home language. Um, an expensive um, activity if, if you didn't have that kind of sponsorship. Um, so I, th I feel that we're quite lucky in, in being able to do that. We found out several things. Firstly, um, in talking about English, I did have a slide of the stats, but it didn't go through the email, so you're just going to have to remember these numbers, but I, I'll keep them simple. So just talking about English, 65% of parents believe that they speak and read English well, 65%. 82% um, said their children speak it well. So you have, again, that it's not a huge disparity, but it's significant. 78% uh, thought that their children read very well. And 96% um, of these parents, so this is 100 parents, have English children's books in their home. 70% read often with their children, and 96% want more to read with their children. And the interesting thing about that is if you were to do a similar survey in the same socioeconomic cir um, circumstances of white British families, you would have far less positive reading culture. So what we're seeing instantly is that there is a real value on the reading of literature, not the telling of traditional folk tales or, or oral storytelling, but the reading of published literature. And then when you, when you go into the home language questions, 89% um, said that they speak it the most at home. And then 45% said that their children are not able to read very well or at all in their home language. This was one of the things we picked out of the process of fusion was that what, what and this, I think this came through in, um, in uh, expressive feedback from facilitators and parents was that um, they, the value they placed on the project was that it was enriching their children's vocabulary in their home language. And, and I think the facilitators all noticed that their vocab vocabulary in the home language was very limited. So this was because it was a creative literacy project and it, it built on their vocabulary. 95% um, of those parents want their children to read better in their home language. 85% want children's books in their home language. 83% would buy them. 67% do not have books in their home language at all. Um, those that did were all European languages. So it's quite clear there's no literature being um, provided for these very significant language groups across the country. When you begin to look at those demographics, the Somali community is quite significant across the country, let alone the Bangladeshi community. So you actually have a market there, a market that could be direct sold to. And part of these surveys, I can send the, the analysis to people if they're interested. We also looked at... Um, where they want to access these books, and they want to buy them through their schools, and they want to be able to borrow, borrow them through their libraries. So, summing up, bilingual parents value books and have them at home. Their children speak and, and read English better than they do. They read in English with their children and want more opportunities to do so. But fundamentally, they are a reading culture. They want their children to read better in their home language. They want their children to connect with their home culture through reading. They want their children... They, they do not mainly have books in their home language, and they want to buy and borrow books in their home language. And 
last thing to say was that on the top of this research is we built a project and put a lot of time into it and took it to two funders who weren't particularly interested in it. And it's, it's there. It's a package project. And the project um, is with four children's uh, authors. One of them is Salvatore Rubina, who you'll know from uh, Walker Books, Jane Ray, um, two other author illustrators, uh, a former editor of Penguin at Puffin Children's Books, uh, an art director at Walker. And we got together and we devised and built this project. And the whole idea is that we, these four authors were going to work with family groups um, to develop stories, to develop some of the content for those stories. The author illustrators would go away and make the books with the editor and the art director. They would be tested at, at key points. And there would obviously be writer translators in the room. We would publish them only in those home languages, not um, bilingual. And because the whole point would be about the richness of the vocabulary of those texts, not a translation from English. And we would then uh, create a, a direct marketing campaign that would be partly devised with those family groups to reach Somali communities up and down the country, but also abroad. And um, we formed a partnership with Runnymede Trust to kind of develop this, and it went no further. It's there. So if anybody is interested <laughs> in taking this forward with us, we would love that. Um, that's all I've got to say. Thank you.